Security controls, you know you want them, you know you need them, but you don't know about them. I'm going to solve that problem for you coming up now. Hello, everybody. My name is Adam Gordon, and I'm Tanner here at IT Pro TV. I want to have a conversation with you about security controls, something most of us probably think we understand and do a good job with in our businesses, but in reality, we probably need a little bit of additional guidance. Answering three specific questions hopefully is going to help us to do that. And we need to make sure we're focusing our discussion around the primary goal of using security controls, which is addressing a dreaded four letter word, not the one you're probably thinking about, but this one right here that I'm putting on the light board for us, which is risk. This is the key to understanding and unlocking not only our ability to be able to use security controls, but really helping us to understand and put into context what they can do and how they help us to achieve that. Let's frame those three questions I was talking about just a moment ago. How do we describe security controls is where I wanna begin because understanding the key descriptors, the difference between categories and types is gonna help us to understand the value that security controls provide. That value is best discussed and framed by answering the question why. Why do we need security controls? Why are they valuable to our business? And finally, let's talk about what. What are security controls able to do for us? Specifically, what are these seven types of controls we have sitting over here actually gonna help us to accomplish? Let's jump in and begin by talking about how we describe security controls. We have categories over here on the light board and categories are gonna help us to group together controls at a high level. They may be administrative in nature, policy-based, giving us guidance that's going to help us to understand how things should be done, aligning with business requirements, regulatory, statutory concerns, things of that nature. Technical logical controls are operating system driven. They're implemented through software and they're going to allow us to implement safeguards, controls, countermeasures, all synonyms for one another, by the way, that allow us to treat risk, minimize it, and minimize its impact specifically on us, our business, and of course the assets of the organization. But the key here is that they're software-based, they're implemented through the operating system and or an application, both of which are software. And finally, as a category, physical controls. I often refer to these as the guards, guns, and gates conversation when I talk to customers and students. These are controls that manifest themselves in the physical world. We can touch them, feel them, interact with them. Literally, they are guards, they are guns, they are gates, and a variety of other physical measures like doors and windows and closed circuit TV monitoring that allow us to understand our environment and in one way or another, monitor and constrain it. When we think about categories, in other words, we think very broadly about groupings of controls based on some sort of approach or functionality. As we then get more granular, more tactical in our approach with regards to defining controls, we turn our attention to types. And types, as you could see, there are seven of them here, are gonna allow us to understand how we can make a very specific choice to help us to impact and minimize risk, and in so doing, allow us to address risk so that we can push it down as far as possible, trying to minimize that impact in the organization and more broadly throughout the organizational environment across all the things we do and of course across all the assets that we operate with. And so as we think about how we are describing, we want to make sure we understand that categories are very broad and types are very specific. That's a really important takeaway from the first question. Let's turn our attention to why. Why do we want to use controls? Why are they valuable to an organization, to you as an individual, and by extension to your organization? Well, they give us the ability, as we were just talking about, let's draw our other hour here to really highlight us on this. They give us this ability to do the following. Right? Make sure that we try to get rid of risk if at all possible. Even draw a little line over here just to make sure we see it's kind of X'd out. Now the reality is we're never gonna completely get rid of risk. There's always gonna be some risk left, which is why I left the word risk right in the middle of the diagram there. But the reality is we could certainly shrink that circle, minimize that risk, write it much, much smaller, right? So that we can see that eh, it's a lot smaller than it was. And as a result, a lot less impactful to us and controls are gonna really help us to get to that point. And that's the why. 
Let's talk now about the what, right? Specifically, I've already defined the idea of what the categories provide for us in terms of groupings, but I haven't really touched on what the individual types of controls are. I want to run them down for you quickly. Make sure you have a high level understanding of the seven distinct controls and therefore the seven choices we get to make with regards to how we try to minimize that risk down, make it as small and tiny as possible. Let's start at the top here with directive. We think about directive controls, we're thinking about controls that provide guidance that are aligned primarily with the administrative category. They're very likely policy nature, policy in nature, policy driven and or policy like, and they're giving us specific guidance aligning us with one or more requirements that the organization has fundamentally laid out and made clear we need to follow. And so when we think about this, we're thinking about really controls that are going to give guidance, but guidance from a policy driven standpoint or vantage point. They tell us to do something, and they may or may not tell us why it's important to do that. Deterrent controls are going to often be paired, let's just make a little connector here so we can see this pairing, are often going to be paired with preventative controls. People tend to confuse the two. I want to make it clear for you what they are, but we should see them as essentially two sides of the same coin. Deterrent controls, and the name itself kind of implies what the definition is, deterrent controls are meant to discourage behavior. You walk up to a community or a house or an area that's fenced off, it has a fence, it has a gate, has a guard, has a big sign that says, do not trespass, bad dog. Well, that hopefully is enough to deter you, to make you make smarter choices and not decide to try to go in there when you don't belong or aren't invited. Whereas a preventative control is meant to stop you if you really don't make good choices because the deterrence was not enough. If we add to all those things I just described, a layer, a series behind that fence of guards that are standing there waiting to capture you and escort you off the property, then that's gonna prevent you from getting inside. And as a result, even if you make a bad choice, we're gonna stop you. And so when we think about both deterrent and we think about preventative controls, we think about ways in which we can either encourage you to make good choices or stop you if you make bad choices. Let's talk about compensating controls. Compensating controls, these are designed to step in and allow us to have a secondary control, a backup system, if you will, that will prevent something bad from happening because the primary control that we were relying on for some reason is not operable or has failed. So if you imagine, for instance, that we have a computer that runs normally plugged into our wall, getting power from the power grid from the electricity provider, the utility company, and everything is fine except when there's a storm and the power is interrupted. Well, if we had a compensating control, we would use a backup battery solution, what we call a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply, where we plug the computer instead of into the wall, into the battery box that then is plugged into the wall. During normal operations, we get power directly from the utility company, everything's fine. But when the power cuts off, we still have power, we still have power from the batteries and the computer could still be run safely for a period of time, shutting it down, eliminating and significantly reducing the likelihood we're gonna damage the data or damage the system by shutting it down uh, hard, as we said, right? With no power all of a sudden just turning it off. So compensating controls are meant to offset the loss of a primary control. And the primary control could be one of the other types, whatever they are. Let's turn our attention to detective controls. Well, detective controls are just like detectives in real life. They look for clues and they try to tell us and alert us and show us that things are abnormal and that we should pay attention to them because likely something bad has happened or is about to happen and we're seeing it unfold in near real time. So detective controls, just like Sherlock Holmes or any detective that you like, are good sleuths. They look for things and they help us to uncover activity that's probably gonna be an issue for us and that we wanna take action to correct. Corrective controls, having just said the word, corrective controls are those controls that allow us to take action after something most likely has been detected, some bad thing has happened, and we wanna put it right. We wanna get back to normal and we wanna stop having this issue and return operations the way, the way they were before this occurred. Now, corrective and recovery controls are also usually grouped together, by the way, because recovery controls are like an extension 
of corrective controls, but they have more features, more capability, more depth. They're technically, in other words, gonna give us more options, and they're often used in combination with corrective controls to, again, restore systems and operations to normal after some sort of bad event has occurred, but to do so with more capabilities more often than not. So these seven make up our types, grouped together into one of three categories, and what we then have ultimately is our ability to bring this all together to shrink risk into a more manageable size, hopefully minimizing it enough that the impact to our organization is negligible or certainly less than it would have been otherwise. You could see the size difference there hopefully indicates that. And as a result, we live to fight another day. I've been Adam Gordon talking to you about security controls on behalf of IT Pro TV. If you want to learn more about security controls or any of the other thousands of things we talk about and teach about every day, always want to invite you to come and take a look over at IT Pro TV. Spend some time with us. Myself and all my fellow entertainers are always up for opportunities to spend time with you, helping you to better understand your world and making sure you have all the knowledge you need to be successful. I'll be back soon with another conversation, but until I am, I'll wish you happy securing and I'll see you soon.